thank you that you open our hearts and ask you now to open your word to us, especially as we begin, Lord, to get into some of the more mysterious parts of the of the Revelation of St. John. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, a couple weeks ago we were talking about the different understandings of the end times. You know, and I, I shared with you about the different understanding of what the rapture is and, and, and that kind of a thing. And, and how that impacts the way, and I just want to, I didn't give the handouts again. If you got them, you got them from two weeks ago. Uh, but how that impacts the way people look at the book of Revelation. You know, one of the big things that we talked about was this whole idea of what is the Millennial Kingdom. And there are those who, who would put the Millennial Kingdom after, uh, after the first judgment, they, what they call the first judgment, and the thousand year literal reign of Christ on earth, and then the final judgment in heaven. There are others that would say that this thousand years, but he's not really here, he's figuratively reigning, it's a thousand years of prosperity. There's that viewpoint. That all impacts how you look at the book of Revelation. The most prevalent group is the, this, in the United States, not necessarily in the world, but in the United States, is the dispensationalists. And they divide history into dispensations, and that what they would really say is that the book of Revelation is really about the last two dispensations. Um, they would say that what you have here is a vision of, of the end, and, and then the millennium kingdom, and so forth. Um, we are, in the Lutheran Church, we are a millennialists. And that, you know, just, you know, you add an A in front of somebody to say that we're not, we don't believe in a literal millennial kingdom. We believe that the scriptures are very clear. Jesus says it, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Paul says it, he has been placed his head over all things for the church. He, uh, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 15, that he must must reign until the last enemy is put under his feet, right? And then he'll hand over the kingdom to his God and Father, 1 Corinthians 15. So we believe that basically the thousand years is from the time when Christ ascended until he comes again at the end. That it's a, it's a symbolic, metaphoric number the way all numbers are in apocalyptic literature. You can't take them literally as a literal thousand years. It's a complete, great, large time. Ten times ten times ten. You know, that, that uh, and ten is a number for completeness in, in apocalyptic literature. So we believe, we believe that Christ is reigning right now. And that's an article received only by faith. Because his word says it. Because when we look at the world, what do we see? Even, even as weird things like making congressmen feel like comfortable in a restaurant and all this other stuff. Just kind of a, out of control. But we believe in spite of what our eyes tell us because that's what he promised, that he's ruling. We believe this, this year, every one of them has what's called Satan, Satan's little season. At the end, and then judgment in heaven. Um, we believe that there are a series of seven cyclical visions that form the main body of the Revelation of St. John, okay? And that each of these visions is really about this whole period. In the same way that the signs of the end that Jesus gives are about for most of this whole period. Any um, interpretation of the scriptures that says there's seven years of this and three and a half years of that and this is when the end will come and it would give you any idea that you can calculate exactly when Jesus comes ignores his own words. No one knows the date, the time, not even the Son of Man, the Father, only. Okay. And we're going to get into this because 
Each, if, if you remember correctly, I think I tried to share with you that, that one of the characteristics of John when he writes is he tends to circle his subject. You see it in the Gospel of John, where he circles it with sign after sign, building up evidence until he gets to the last chapter, or the 20th chapter, the last verse, and he says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the whole subject of the Gospel of John, and he circles it again and again. You'll see it um, in with faith, and righteousness, and love as the three things that are at the heart of the first epistle of John. He circles, he circles that subject again and again. Well, the, the, if, if the Gospel of John is Jesus in his humiliation, the book of Revelation is Jesus in his glory, and the subject is Jesus and his triumph. So we're going to get today, this is where your sheets are, and I would like some feedback from you, and, and if you want to go on to the next screen there, John, you can. Um, we're going to get today into the fourth chapter of the Revelation of St. John. Okay? We've got, to read, we've got to set the context. We spent chapters 2 and 3 looking at what? Seven churches. And what, what, would, you, what, what would be true about all those churches? Go ahead. They needed to be ship-shaped. Where's Christ when I hear back there? They needed to be ship-shaped. They needed to be shaped up, okay, or ship-shaped, okay? <laughs> They were all in the midst of a world that was what? Hostile to the Christian faith. Evil, hostile to the Christian faith. And many of them were facing severe persecution, weren't they, for their faith? Many of them, um, you'll hear them talk about it in each one. And I think it's why you need to remember the Old Testament context of the book of Revelation. <coughs> Where did God set his people in the Old Testament? What, where, where, where were they found? Where did he settle them? In Israel. Well, they were Israel. They settled in Palestine, right? And you all know what that means. If you don't, I'm going to share it with you. You picture the ancient world and the Sea of the uh, of Mediterranean here, and there is the Nile. What's over here? Egypt. Egypt. And what's over here? Syria, Assyria, Assyria, Babylon, Mesopotamia. What sits right here? Israel, Palestine. There's a reason why. This tiny little country, and it's tiny, sits on the most fought over piece of land in human history. Crossroads. If you controlled here, you controlled the ancient world. You controlled commerce, trade, how to make money, and all that stuff. And so these empires are constantly coming in to Congress. If you go, there's a reason. If you, uh, how many of you have been to Israel? You can go. Have you been to the town of Megiddo? The city of Megiddo. It's one of the ancient. Uh, you go there. You go to the ruins of Megiddo. It sits up on a hill. The valley of Megiddo stretches out before it. It was a high city, and in fact, when you go there, what they've uncovered are, the gates are, they say, are from the time of Abraham. Okay, so that's how ancient the city is and before. Megiddo sits and looks over the valley of Armageddon, which is a, which is a uh, huge plain that stretches out from there. And right past Megiddo goes the Via Maris. 
which was the major trading route in the ancient world. So if you could control Megiddo, you control the ancient world. And that becomes a reason why when John wants to pick a word for the final battle, he talks about Armageddon. Okay? Because that's a place where battles have been fought in his day throughout history. And you know, even with airplanes and sea lanes and everything else, where is the most hostile hotbed of trouble in the world today? That's right there. God puts his people here. That means he sets them at the crossroads. Because if you're going to spread a message, the most important thing is location, location, location. And in that world, everybody at one time or another passed through there. So he says, okay, so we'll set up a shop right here. Right? That's why, you know, that's why John the Baptist um, was situated where he was. He put him at a place along the Jordan where people coming from Galilee would cross over one side of the Jordan, come down, and then just before Jericho crossed back over. So it was a big intersection. Location, location, <laughs> location, right? And so it was, it was a major, well, he puts his people here so they can spread the message. But what's going to happen? This is, a, this is not a safe place. So you need to understand God puts his people in unsafe places. So they have no choice but to trust him and to, and to, and to share his message. Well, that's, that's the Old Testament context for the book of Revelation. He's saying to these people, listen, you, you are set in a heathen, pagan world. And your job in these towns is to be my people and share the message. I always felt strange when I got the call to Germany. And they said, now I'm a missionary. You all know that I was a missionary before that. <coughs> Do you all know that you are missionaries? In fact, God has placed you in the third largest mission field in the world. The United States of America. Okay? Other churches from other parts of the world send missionaries here now. Because there are so much, there's so many unchurched and unbelievers living in our country. So he puts us here to be missionaries, but if you're going to be missionaries in a place that's hostile to him, then you can expect hostility. And you shouldn't be surprised by it. Right? You know? Well, that's part of the... Now, when, when you look at the world, I wonder how many of you have ever asked the question, or thought to yourself, you got to a point in life and you thought to yourself, there's got to be more to it than this. You ever thought that? Maybe you just got bored with life, got troubled with life, got, got really just at times wondering, really, Lord, is it ever getting any better? There's got to be more to it than this. Remember, these folks, in this day, they were told, you pay your taxes to Caesar. But when you pay your taxes to Caesar, you have to participate in something called emperor worship. And the emperor at the time of the writing of Revelation is Domitian. And this area of Asia Minor is one of the places where emperor worship really takes hold. And so they would have to pay their taxes. They would, when they paid their taxes, they would pinch, take a pinch of incense.
incense and burn it, and be required to declare that Caesar is Lord and God. Now, if you're a polytheist, and you believe there's many gods, what's the big deal? Right? Or we'll just add another one. We'll just declare this guy's got an ego, we'll just declare him God. Who do you suppose has a problem? Which at the time there were only two kinds of monotheists. The Jews and Christians. And they're related to each other, right? So the Christian, who is Lord and God? And so take that incense in order to pay your taxes and burn it and declare that Caesar is Lord and God is a denial of your faith. And you, you think that's, that's a, a small thing. I will tell you a little story. <laughs> so under in Texas, Canada, we, this it seemed like a silly thing. We belonged to the church softball league. And all the churches in town had a team. And when, the way you knew which was the home team, the home team was required to lead the prayer. Well, in the church league was a group that we would not consider a church. The Mormons. We don't consider them to be Christians. And they, uh, they were going to be the home team. And I didn't even think about it. My coach did from the church team. He said, Pastor, what do I do? Why don't you go talk to the umpire? And the umpire, he went to the umpire and he said, he said, you know, uh, we can't participate in a prayer that's offered by a non-Christian group. Because it's not the same God. It would be a denial of our witness. And I love the umpire solution. Well, I'm Baptist. Can I lead it? <laughs> I said, yes! <laughs> Now, you may think that's trivial, but I have a friend who's here with us at time. He's a pastor of the Bible Church who grew up in Salt Lake City. And I went and talked to him. I said, we're making a mountain out of mobile. He said, absolutely not. Because they want to pass themselves off as if they're just another kind of Christian. And by participating, you're, you're confirming that. So sometimes those choices is the same choice. Okay, maybe not not for the for the not for us. All we did we still played the baseball game, got an umpire. But for these folks, if they didn't do it, they could be denied their jobs. They could they, they could be in prison. Eventually, they they could be put to death. John is in exile. An old man, a hard piece of rock called Pappas, made to do hard labor because he wouldn't bend. And he's the pastor, he's the apostle to these churches, and he's telling them, don't bend. And, and, and at the time when they're losing everything because of their faith, and they're wondering, where's the good part of this being Christian? That's the reason this book is written. The Christians in the midst of suffering, the midst of an evil pagan world, who are called to love that world and to share Christ with that world in the face of opposition, and have to be wondering sometimes, is this worth it? And it sure seems like I became a Christian and things went from bad to worse. Okay? Fourth and fifth chapter of Revelation is the first vision. And in the fourth and fifth chapter, he's going to pull back the veil and show us what's going on behind the scene. That which we cannot see with our eyes. 
That's the point of chapters 4 and 5. We'll walk through it. If you open your Bibles to Revelation 4 and 5.
type that pointed forward to the Messiah. But Jesus is more than that when we see it in his fulfillment. Okay? So that's what you see here. So anyways, he sees a throne, and someone seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian around the throne, and it was a rainbow that with the appearance of an emerald. Now, what does it suggest to you that he's sitting down? Could be teaching. Well, this is the king. He's reigning. Take your Bibles. Go over to, I think it's, let me look here. I think it's um, Psalm 2. Yeah, Psalm 2. I don't know if I got the right one on my notes. Second Psalm, which is, I believe, verse four. Let's we'll start at the beginning. Psalm two. Why do the nations rage? The people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. This is a messianic psalm. His anointed is Christ. Let us burst their bonds asunder and cast away their force from us. Let's just shake off God's chains. He who sits, this is verse 4, he who sits on the throne, what's his response to all that? He laughs. He laughs. He doesn't even bother to stand up. Nothing that man can do can threaten him. <clears throat> All of man's raging and stomping up and down. We're going to show God who's boss. And God's reaction is, <laughs> yeah, here you got it, is to sit there and laugh. The picture of him being seated on the throne is a picture of the fact that he's in control. That he, 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 the things we do don't worry him enough to make him get up out of his chair. He's seated on the throne. He's king, and there's no threat to that. Go on in chapter 2 there. It says, he says, uh, he says, that he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very much a picture of God in control. And the, now the thing you have to watch, I, I don't know, some, some of you might be experts in precious gems. The thing you have to watch is that what was called Jasper and Carnelian and so forth in the ancient world is not always the same as the stones we give that name to now. Okay, so they have different colors. The idea is is that he's otherworldly. I don't know if it's a, um, a picture there. Turn to slide three. So. You know, it's, just, it's just supposed to picture kind of the this, this is otherworldly. This is what you're getting here is, you know, we're all worried here on earth about all the things going wrong. We worry and fret. Well, let's take a look at what's going on in heaven about all the stuff that we worry about. God is seated on his throne. And it's a beautiful sight. What's, what circles God? Look at the text. What circles it? A rainbow. Why in the scriptures is a rainbow important? It's a promise. No. Right, it's part of the it's part of the covenant with Noah, which means it's part of the covenant with the whole human race, right? And when you somebody 
somebody in the recently, I don't know where it was, it was yesterday when we were talking, they seen a beautiful rainbow someplace. Must not have been anybody in this group. Okay. <laughs> have you ever seen a rainbow? Well, that's. I saw one in Hawaii and I saw the end of it and there was no part of gold. And <laughs> yeah, don't believe everything the Irish tell you. <laughs> What does a rainbow make you think of? It what? It's rain? Okay, the rain is over. What, what, did he, what was the rainbow to remind people of? What did he promise? He would never destroy the earth again by a flood. The rain will end. Even Harvey came to an end. Sorry, Harvey. <laughs> right? I think from listening, I wasn't here, but from listening to you, I think you got a taste of a couple of days of what it might have been like for the people of Noah's Day, right? <laughs> that went on for 40 days, then. But it's a, it's a symbol of God's promise. Did the world stop deserving God's wrath after the flood? No. The first thing that happens after they get off the ark is the, the sun start messing around, right? <laughs> Doing stupid stuff. Right? Noah gets drunk. So it's not that they're more deserving now. So the rainbow of his promise is a symbol of his mercy. It's also a symbol of who's in charge. Because he's the God who can make it rain and make it stop. He's the God who can flood the earth and make the waters recede. He's <laughs> and he's merciful. And the rainbow is, is to remind us that he will keep his promise. That's why it gets, rainbows are prevalent in, in Christian symbolism, especially Easter. Right? You especially see it around the Easter season. So it, it, he's, he's, he's in charge, he's in control, he's gracious, he rules. And then see it around, go back to the, the Revelation. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. Now, who are these guys? You, it is one thought that they could be angelic beings. I got a picture here. I think there's another slide. And then go to the next one. I think that was supposed to be the rainbow. Go to the next one. The 24 elders. Who are they? They're wearing what? White. Crowns. And how many are there? 24. White is suggestive of forgiveness, grace. Okay? The, the 24, what, is any, any idea where that comes from?
uh, Tracy's giving me a, a, a dispensation for um, LWL Sunday. <laughs> for all the saints. If you get a chance, open the hymnal with it. And, and notice something. When do we enter heaven? When Jesus dies and the whole church enters together in his train. That's the King of Glory we have to talk about. It's beautiful. It's great imagery. It's out of space, out of this, out of Revelation. But anyway, so he's got 24 elders, the leader, the, the church, the, the 12 plus 12, the crowns on their head, and they're seated on thrones too. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. Remember, we see the seven churches, which are the seven spirits of God, the Holy. And before the throne was as it were a sea of glass, like crystal. Now, a sea of glass, what does it suggest? Now, this is where you got to become Jewish for a second. The sea in um, Jewish life was considered to be a place of evil and danger. You'll notice that they are, for the most part, not a sea going people. Okay? There are no real natural harbors in Israel, they're, they're kind of a mountain people. I'm not calling him pillow, is it? Well, because they live mostly in the mountains of, of Israel. Um, the idea that the sea is glass and crystal, right? That suggests that it's at peace and calm. And Everything is fine. And even the sea is calm before God. That he has everything under control. And then he goes on, he says, uh, around the throne, I love this, and you can go to the next slide. I believe I got this slide. Yeah, here they are. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an angel in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them has six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and who was and who is to come. Now, what, is, what are the animals? What are the four animals? Lion, ox, man, and eagle. Think about those four animals and, and man. Three animals and man. What's the lion? Power, right? He's the, the king of the wild animal, right? What's the ox suggest to you? Man, brains, hopes big sometimes, <laughs> intelligence, and the eagle. Freedom, speed, he's the greatest of the birds, right? They all serve God. They're all a picture of the fact that they've got all these eyes, right? They're, they can see everything, nothing can be hidden from him. They're all powerful, nothing can escape him. He, you know, the whole thing, it's, it's a picture of the It's also a picture of the four living creatures. Four is a number for creation. The four corners of the earth. The whole of creation. And what are they saying? Now notice, what's the song again? Holy, holy, holy. So there's three holies, and then at the end, what's there? Who is, was, and is to come. So there's three, two, a set of three here, and a set of three here, and right in the middle, the Lord God Almighty. 
So the, all of that is meant to put the focus on God. He's holy, holy, holy. He is who was and who is to come. He's God. And notice what he's called. Lord God. Not see. Is it worth it? Yes, because you worship the one who really is Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, my stomach probably gets it. <laughs> Mike is powerful. Then, verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, here's the whole church, fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and praise. There's the three. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So, again, there's that set of three. You created all things, and then the end, they were created, and in the middle is, it's all by your will and doing. The whole point of chapter 4 is that God's in charge. What are you worried about? God is seated on his throne. The whole church worships him. The whole creation has to serve him. It all exists because he called it into existence. He keeps his promises. He can stop the rain. He can start it. He can do anything <coughs> with worry. God's in control. So that's only halfway through the vision. The even better part of what's next in chapter 5, which is next week. <laughs> any any, any uh, thoughts or questions that you have? Go ahead. That's uh, in the scriptures of seven spirits. Is Number seven, the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I got a passage in there for that. Let me look here and see if I can get I will look for it. It's in Isaiah. Yeah, but this is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to look at, um, I don't have the passage written down here. It's in Isaiah. Um, but I didn't write it down for some reason. I will look for it and get for it. Seven is number for complete, so I remember that. All right, let's bar the prayer. Father, grant to us eyes of faith. In the midst of a world when we wonder, is everything going to hell with a handbasket, we can, we can know the reality is that you're in charge and that you're seated on your throne and that there's nothing you can't handle. Calm our fears like that crystal sea before your throne. That we might trust always in you. In your name we pray. Amen.